September of 1966, it appeared that President Johnson had gone back to the campaign trail for the steady long haul towards the month of November. In the wings, experts of every description, politicians, pundits, cartoonists, and sociologists stood waiting to exhaustively dissect, examine, or make predictions about one of America's great institutions and one of its great imponderables, the off-year elections. Then as the campaign moved into its final 50 days, and few could agree on any early estimate of its final outcome, the world was suddenly and dramatically reapprised of the aspirations of other men. Men whose depth of awareness and total commitment to a new dream might one day reshape the destiny of an entire frontier. Their beginning success would hinge upon the reactions and convictions of the President of the United States. We're on the go. People are working. People are eating. They have high hopes. Their schools are being improved. Their hospitals are being improved. We are doing what a democratic president, a democratic government ought to do for a democratic people. On Saturday, September the 3rd, President Johnson made a quick one-day foray into West Virginia and Pennsylvania. By mid-morning, the presidential helicopter had landed at the site of West Virginia's new $46 million flood control project, the Summersville Dam, the largest earth and rock structure of its kind east of the Mississippi. At Summersville, President Johnson set the date for an international Water for Peace conference to be held in Washington during the month of May and drawing some 700 representatives from over 100 countries, including the Soviet Union. Hopefully, such a conference would focus universal attention on man's great need for abundant water supplies. So it should be clear by now that we're in a race with disaster. Either the world's water needs will be met or the inevitable result will be mass starvation in the world, mass epidemics, mass poverty greater than anything you have ever known before. So we must be prepared to take action and we must take it quickly. We know that the battle can be won. By early afternoon, the president's caravan had air hopped across the Appalachians to Pennsylvania's York Harrisburg Airport for a visit to the small community of Dallas Town, which was celebrating its first centennial. The 89th Congress was the first Congress to direct most of its legislative thrust toward a nation of city dwellers. Dealing with the real dynamics of urban life, they had tackled slum housing, underemployed minorities, inadequate schools, polluted air and water, rising crime, and shrinking recreational facilities. At the Dallas Town Centennial, President Johnson would cite and attack a counter problem, one that day by day was drawing his vital interest and deep concern the gradual death of the small American town. A death caused by an ever-increasing migration of young people away from the farms and small communities in search of jobs and better wages in the cities. That same story is being repeated all over America. But I don't think it has to happen. Modern industry and modern technology and modern transportation can bring jobs to the countryside rather than people to the cities. And modern government could also help. I want to see more factories located in rural regions. I want those who love the land to reap all the benefits of modern living. So if we can begin to stem the migration in our own land, we will make our mark on history. I believe that more and more of our people will choose to live in towns like Dallas Town. I know they would if they could come here and see what I'm looking at this afternoon. The announcement from the White House that President Johnson would make a fast-moving four-stop trip through Michigan and Ohio on Labor Day had an illuminating postscript. 
the National Democratic Committee would foot the travel bill. The meaning was clear. The trip would mark the beginning of the official off-year election campaign tour for the head of the Democratic Party. For President Johnson, veteran campaigner that he was, this would be a new experience. For the first time as president, he would assume the official political duty of promoting the election of public officials other than himself. Off-year elections, lacking a White House race at the top of the ticket, are always notoriously deceptive barometers. But there could be no doubt that the outcome would have a profound effect on the fortunes of the great society. The starting gate opened officially at an AFL-CIO rally in Detroit's Cobo Hall. Although he paid homage to one of labor's major goals with a promise for another try at outlawing state right-to-work laws during the new year, President Johnson coupled his promise with a stern call for labor to hold their wage demands within reason. And then, obviously aiming his words at a few foreign critics of U.S. policy in Vietnam, he talked about the conditions for the withdrawal of American troops. If anyone will show me the time schedule when aggression and infiltration and might makes right will be halted, then I, as president of this country, will lay on the table the schedule for the withdrawal of all of our forces from withdrawal. During the summer months, President Johnson had barnstormed across the country, meeting crowds at airport fences or on the streets. And nearly everywhere he went, the people had been warm and appreciative, especially those in the smaller towns. In Michigan, it appeared that things hadn't changed. Obviously, the contrast between the popularity polls and the enthusiasm of the crowds was going to become one of the paradoxes of the campaign. Despite the many complex issues surrounding the off-year elections, his critics knew that wherever he went, there was one banner that he could wave effectively and justifiably the considerable accomplishments of his administration. And one of the proud banners was Medicare, an appropriate subject for the ceremony marking the 100th anniversary of Michigan's famous Battle Creek Sanitarium. A nation cannot think if it's sick. A nation cannot fight to protect itself if it's sick. So long as I am in your office of presidency, I'm going to make every effort I know how to ensure and guarantee the greatest possible progress in the field of health at the lowest possible cost to the individual. At 5.08 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, President Johnson arrived at the Montgomery County Fairground in Dayton, Ohio. Ahead still lay the trips to Port Columbus and Lancaster before his evening return to the White House. Although he would continue to chronicle the two-year story of the successes and challenges of his administration throughout the rest of the day, one of the sharpest keynotes of the Ohio trip would come at Dayton when he talked about the young people of America. The young follow the suit of their parents who live by the philosophy, don't stick your neck out, don't get involved. From this philosophy comes either willful violence or willful indifference. So I'll say to America in this hour, let us guarantee to our young people more than the right to dissent. Let us give them not only an opportunity to declare against something, let's give them a chance to declare for something. On the morning of September the 8th, President Johnson welcomed Burma's General Ni Win to Washington. Ever since he had seized governing power in 1962, Ni Win, as Burma's Prime Minister, Defense Minister, and Chairman of its ruling Revolutionary Council, had followed a policy of international non-alignment, a policy which had won him the reputation of being the most neutral of the neutrals. This is a policy which we in the United States understand for the right of people to choose their own form of development has been a fundamental principle of the United States policy, a deeply held article of our national faith for 200 years. We had the very good fortune to 
grow from a handful of isolated colonies to a position of great responsibility in the world. Uh, we did not deliberately seek this position. In a real sense, the force of history shaped it for us. Though faced by rising wages and prices and a steadily increasing scarcity of money, President Johnson had refrained from taking any major action against the inflation that was gripping the country. He hoped somehow that it would stay within bounds, but it would not be held back. So at his 72nd news conference, held at 3 p.m. on September the 8th, he requested emergency action from Congress to help cool off the accelerated boom. Although many of his critics would charge that he should have acted sooner, President Johnson's five-point proposal constituted a milestone in the history of federal economic policy. It was the first time that any U.S. president had requested a change in taxes strictly for the purpose of lessening a business boom. On Monday, September the 12th, the world was talking about another milestone. In the face of fierce Viet Cong threats, the people of South Vietnam had gone to the polls to vote. The first step in the arduous process of building a democracy had begun. It was a singular victory, not only for Premier Ki and the people of South Vietnam, but for the Johnson administration, which had held firm in the belief that such a victory was possible. Even while many Americans were still studying the headlines about the election turnout in South Vietnam, the United States was achieving another first. At 9.42 Eastern Standard Time on the morning of September 12th, astronauts Pete Conrad and Richard Gordon roared off the pad at Cape Kennedy in their Gemini 11 vehicle. After hitting a precise two-second window of time, and while still in their first orbit, the astronauts rendezvoused and docked with their Agena target vehicle, which had been launched a few hours ahead of them. For President Johnson, the Gemini 11 mission was more than just another spectacular advance in the space exploration. As a former chairman of the National Aeronautic Space Council, and as the man who had sponsored the law that established NASA, he had often heard other men say, go slow, back off, why should we go to the moon? he had held firm. Now he was holding his ground again, this time in Vietnam, a war that each day continued to produce its heartbreaking tragedies, triumphs, and heroes. Heroes like construction mechanic third class Marvin Shields, a Navy CB who had been killed at Dong Hoi while serving with conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. On the morning of September 13th, Marvin Shields was awarded the Medal of Honor. The award was accepted by Mrs. Joan Shields and her two-year-old daughter, Barbara. Despite the many criticisms leveled at the White House about the conduct of the war in Vietnam, few candidates for office in November elections would take issue with the administration's viewpoint. As one critic put it, they all know that Lyndon Johnson had been the most fervid advocate for peace in and around his administration. The difficulty, however, is that he is not selling politicians or people, but governments. And the selling has to be done long range. In the normal course of events, official visits by foreign heads of state often have little impact on the relations between two countries. But the arrival of Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos and his lovely wife Imelda promised to be one of the rare exceptions. For the two leaders, the visit represented an opportunity for both of their countries to renew a long-standing bond of friendship. For President Marcos, only 10 months in office after a landslide election victory, this was, of course, an opportunity to seek increased aid for his stagnating home economy. But more importantly, it was also his first opportunity to impress upon the American people some of the home truths about the realities of power in Asia. Realities that had prompted him to commit a 2,000-man force to South Vietnam, despite strong congressional and leftist opposition in his own country. During the course of his 17-day visit, he would address both the United Nations General Assembly and a joint session of Congress. <laughs> 
In each instance, he would eloquently underwrite U.S. aims and policies in Vietnam. To Congress and to President Johnson, he would propose the formation of an Asian forum to deal with any future crisis in Asia, as well as the present conflict in Vietnam. Realistically, the forum would have to be based on the reality of Asian diversity, and it would need to work with the tide of Asian nationalism while looking ahead toward progress and peaceful construction. Whether his plan would die abortively or not, the Marcos visit to Washington had served as a flourish to his entrance onto the international stage. And it had given President Johnson formal notice that this young, articulate Asian leader would be heard from again. September 16th, President Johnson signed the Federal Mine Safety Act, extending new federal health and safety standards to more than a quarter of a million working Americans. Within a week, he would observe his 1,037th day in office, the exact amount of time served by his predecessor, John F. Kennedy. Future historians, looking beyond TV images, news conferences, or Texas accents, would undoubtedly find the accomplishments of those 1,037 days amazing when gauged against the past performances of other presidents. As chief executive, President Johnson had signed a school education bill. His aid to education program had done more for public schools than had been done by anyone else since the days of Horace Mann. He had picked up Medicare, which other presidents had talked about for 20 years, and put it into law. He had signed an auto safety act and a cigarette safety law, which no other president had even thought of doing. Most revolutionary of all, he had passed a rent subsidy bill. Recognizing that the slums had to be cured if the big cities were to survive, he had passed a transportation act to help commuters and had proposed open housing to permit Negroes to move out of the slums. Although the open housing section, as part of the 1966 Civil Rights Bill, would die without coming to a vote in the Senate, the anti-poverty bill would be passed by the House before the month of September was over. Many of these bills had been criticized as too little or too late, but the fact remained, if given a chance, they would take hold. Not even President Franklin D. Roosevelt, with all of his skill and charm, and the desperate drive of the Great Depression behind him, had pushed through a program that in any way equaled the accomplishments of Lyndon Johnson's first 1,037 days in office. On the afternoon of September 23rd, President Johnson came home to Texas for a weekend stay at his LBJ ranch. Just before leaving Washington, he had signed the new minimum wage bill into law. The president's return to Texas coincided with Mrs. Johnson's arrival from her latest conservation tour called Faces of the West, a trip that in four days had carried her across the states of California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Less than an hour later, the newlyweds, Lucy and Pat Nugent, arrived from their apartment in Austin, where both were attending classes at the University of Texas. The weekend opened with a tribute to 250 neighborhood women who had served as hostesses and guides at the president's boyhood home in Johnson City and at his recently reconstructed birthplace near the LBJ Ranch. Among the weekend guests of honor were Pat's brother, Jerry Nugent, and his wife, Phyllis. This was their first visit to the ranch after Jerry's return from Vietnam and a tour of duty with the Marines. Once home, the president's mind turns toward the land, land he knew as a boy. Over the years, it has undergone tremendous change but somehow he always seems to be seeing it for the first time. He goes back to the land as often as he can for as long as he can. 
On September 26th, West Germany's Chancellor Ludwig Erhard arrived in Washington to talk to President Johnson about American troop levels in West Germany, the cost of keeping them there, and the sticky question of West German participation in some kind of joint NATO nuclear force. The following day, as the world waited for some word about the results of their meeting, President Johnson and Chancellor Erhard left Washington for a two-hour tour of this nation's space facilities at Cape Kennedy. At the heart of their discussions was the dollar cost of maintaining more than 2,000 American troops in West Germany. In past years, the expense had been largely offset by Bond's purchases of military hardware from the United States. But now in September of 1966, facing a June deadline for payment to this country and many political and economic uncertainties at home, Chancellor Erhard asked for breathing space. He got it. The two men also agreed on the future formation of an American, British, and German panel, which would make a new and searching reappraisal of NATO's entire military posture. From the landing strip at Cape Kennedy, President Johnson and Chancellor Erhard drove to Launch Complex 19. It was here that all of the two-man Gemini launches had begun. The last of the 12 was already scheduled for an October 31st launching date. During President Johnson's last visit to the Space Center in 1964, he had arrived at a time when most of the space projects and building areas had existed more in name than in fact. Now as he arrived with Chancellor Erhard at the Spaceport's Launch Control Center, the hopefully successful launching of America's first manned lunar expedition appeared to be only three years away. The story of man's advancement throughout history has been the story of his victories over the forces of nature. In that continuing story, our own generation has been given the opportunity to write the grandest chapter of them all. And so, as we explore the vastness of space, and as we dream of new horizons, we work, too, for the man-made controls that will keep these efforts at the service of man and at the service of peace. There is so much ahead of us for all of us to do. With their visit to the Cape completed and their joint communique delivered to the press, President Johnson and Chancellor Erhard headed back toward Washington. If the reporters on the scene were convinced that President Johnson's newsmaking efforts had been turned off for the day, then they hadn't checked the latest dispatches on their own news wires. Because even while the two leaders were still making their tour of the Cape, the White House had made an official announcement. President Johnson had accepted an invitation from President Marcos to meet in the Philippines with the leaders of six Asian nations sometime around the 20th of October. The following day, President Johnson met with West Africa's noted educator, historian, and poet president, Leopold Senghor. The two had last met in 1961 during Senegal's Independence Day celebration. Now, six years later, amidst the inevitable schedule changes, speculations, and wry suspicions of the critics over the Manila announcement, President Johnson took time with Senghor to discuss the rationale behind the United States commitment in Vietnam. By the end of the first week in October, President Johnson had formally announced his intention to not only attend the conference in Manila, but to supplement it with personal visits to five other countries. Predictably enough, this change in plans increased speculation that he would find it hard to resist an additional stopover to visit the American troops in South Vietnam. As if to assure Europe that it had not been forgotten in all of the Asian bustle, he arrived in New York to address the National Conference of Editorial Writers, underscoring his desire for a relaxation of East-West tensions. Later, he held a 50-minute meeting with UN Secretary General Hu Thant, their discussions revolving around the war in Vietnam and its possible avenues for peace. <laughs> 
By mid-afternoon, with the commitments of one foreign policy speech and the climate of international protocol left behind him, President Johnson crossed the Hudson River en route to a political rally at Newark's Military Park. Obviously, he was delighted to be back in the cut and thrust of the political wars. I've told you what the Republican record was. The Democratic record was just the opposite. They passed school bills. They passed Medicare. They gave jobs for your men and income for your families. The Republicans remember that they've always been elected by trying to scare the people. Their platform this year is made up of one word, fear. After a weekend visit to the Texas White House, President Johnson returned to Washington on October 10th to take up a schedule that, even by his standards, was quite frenetic. He was working on the details of his Asian tour, getting ready for one last round of visits for the Democratic Party, and preparing for discussions on Vietnam with Laos Prince Suvanna Fuma, Britain's Foreign Secretary George Brown, and Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko. Although the war in Vietnam was the overriding issue during their one hour and 45 minute talk, the conversation gradually shifted to the prospects of a nuclear non-proliferation treaty, an agreement which would not only be a significant achievement, but would also herald the possibility of a fresh thaw in U.S.-Soviet relations. With the White House struggling against time to complete the arrangements for his Far Eastern swing, it seemed like a good moment for President Johnson to hit the campaign trail. Before a crowd of 20,000 at Social Security headquarters near Baltimore, President Johnson outlined a proposal for across-the-board boosts of at least 10% for all 22 million Social Security beneficiaries. At mid-afternoon, he was back in New York this time moving through the heavy throng that lined the motorcade route along Brooklyn's Flatbush Avenue. The Republicans were fearful to pass Medicare. The Republicans were afraid to fund the war on poverty. 90% of them voted to recommit that bill. The Republicans were afraid to pass the school bill that Hugh Carey helped to lead through the House. Afraid? 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 Republicans are afraid of their own shadows, and they're afraid of the shadow of progress. At 5.55, he spoke at Nassau County's Salisbury Park. That evening, after a brief appearance at a Columbus Day parade on Manhattan's Fifth Avenue, President Johnson made an eloquent plea for interracial understanding before a group of Italian-American businessmen assembled at Brooklyn's Hotel St. George. After an overnight stay in New York, President Johnson flew to Delaware for a speech at Wilmington's Rodney Square. During his New York trip, after more than a dozen stops, it was estimated that he had seen close to one million New Yorkers. But on October the 13th, the crowd at Wilmington seemed overwhelmed. Some 75,000 Delawareans lined the route of the motorcade along Wilmington's North Market Street. And fully 15,000 were jammed close to the speaker's platform at Rodney Square. Although he would hit out again at the Republican Party as he talked about Medicare, education, anti-poverty, and personal income, it was also obvious that his mind was already focused on some of the problems that would confront him at Manila. We believe we should honor our commitments. We believe that we should show the communists in North Vietnam that they cannot, by aggression, take over their neighbors. We believe that we should go the last mile to search for the first faint sign to end hostilities. 
At 9 a.m. on October the 17th, President Lyndon Johnson prepared to depart Washington for the historic Manila Conference. The trip itself was without precedent in American history. No American president had ever set foot in Southeast Asia while he was in office. Although President Truman had touched down briefly at Wake Island to parley with General Douglas MacArthur, and President Eisenhower had journeyed to New Delhi in 1959, it had been left to President Johnson to be the first in Southeast Asia, and to choose Asia rather than Europe for a trip of such magnitude. Nothing could have more clearly demonstrated the fact that for the first time in modern history, the United States seemed just as concerned with Asia as with Europe. For all of its political overtones, President Johnson's Asian progress would undoubtedly constitute a landmark in United States history.